Okay, so welcome to this next video on HER2 amplification and breast cancer. So, in the previous video, what we saw is that a HER2 amplification means gaining extra HER2 genes in your genome, basically, of one of your cells. Okay, so usually in uh, normal cells, you will have two copies of the HER2 gene, one on the two homologous chromosomes, one on each of the two homologous chromosomes. And uh, what happens in amplification is you gain extra genes, additional genes, due to mutations, basically, and quite nasty mutations in that as well. Okay, uh, so that means that this cell that gains this HER2 amplification is going to produce more HER2 receptor and is therefore going to have an increased function of this HER2 receptor. And we said in the previous video that HER2, having increased uh, function of HER2, uh, is then going to lead uh, to pro-growth signals. So we want to see in this video how that happens. Okay, so we're going to look at the um, MAP kinase ERK pathway and also the PI3 kinase um, AKT mTOR pathway. Right, so let me get another piece of paper. So then, uh, when, um, when our epidermal growth factor binds to our HER2 receptor, what's going to happen is that's going to trigger the HER2 receptor to change conformation and what's now going to happen is that the HER2 receptors with epidermal growth factor bound epidermal growth factor bound to them are going to dimerize. So let's draw this dimer here. Okay, so I will demonstrate the change in conformation by this little new domain sticking out here, basically. Okay, and here is our epidermal growth factor bound to the extracellular domain of the epidermal growth factor receptor 2. Okay, so now, here is our other receptor, which it's dimerized with, basically. And unfortunately, I've managed to put that EGF label right where I would have liked to draw another EGF molecule. I suppose that's made up for it. Okay, so what has happened is when the epidermal growth factor molecule has bound to this extracellular domain of the HER2 receptor, which is here in blue, the HER2 receptor changes conformation, and this change in conformation favours the HER2 receptor dimerizing with another HER2 receptor, which has also been activated by epidermal growth factor binding to it. So this is the HER2 receptor here, standing for the human epidermal growth factor uh, receptor 2. I'll give it a capital H. H. Okay, uh, and I'll highlight the epidermal growth factor in orange as well. So it's bound to the extracellular aspect of these receptors. So, so far what has happened is upon EGF binding, you've had the dimerization basically of um, these epidermal growth, well, these her human epidermal growth factor receptor 2, so these HER2 receptors. Now, HER2 receptor, remember that other name for the HER2 receptor was the receptor tyrosine kinase, which is often abbreviated to RTK, uh, and it was the receptor tyrosine kinase ERB herb B2. Okay, um, so the reason it's called that, the reason at least it's called receptor tyrosine kinase, is because um, these HER2 receptors have in their structure a tyrosine kinase domain. So a domain that is capable of catalyzing the phosphorylation of tyrosine residues. So let me just quickly remind you of the structure of, ty of the tyrosine amino acid. So uh, if we draw this here, so, the amino acid tyrosine, so I'll draw firstly the basic structure of the amino acid. So, here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon of the amino acid, here's a hydrogen coming off the alpha carbon that you have in all amino acids, and then uh, here's the carboxylic acid group. Okay, so that's the uh, structure that all amino acid group, uh, all amino acids share. Uh, now let's draw the R group, which is specific to tyrosine. So, in tyrosine, you have a methylene group, like so. And then you have a benzene ring following that methylene group. So here's our benzene ring. And then off the fourth carbon of the benzene ring over here, directly opposite the methylene, you then have a hydroxyl group. So that's the structure of the amino acid tyrosine.
Okay, so this catalytic domain is a tyrosine kinase. So it can add phosphate groups onto this hydroxyl group of the tyrosine amino acid, basically. Okay, and let me show you that reaction. So, uh, if we pull this this way, if I draw a phosphate group here, a phosphate group consists of a phosphorus atom, double bonded to an oxygen there, and then it has two hydroxyl groups coming off it, like so, and then it also has a single bond with an oxygen, which has then got a negative charge because it's acquired uh, another electron through an ionic interaction. Okay, and what can then happen is a condensation reaction between the phosphate group and this hydroxyl group of the tyrosine amino acid, where you take the hydroxyl group off the phosphorus and a hydrogen off the hydroxyl group of the tyrosine and bind this oxygen to the phosphorus atom. So that um, then becomes a phosphorylated tyrosine residue. Now, tyrosine kinase enzymes don't usually uh, manage to put inorganic phosphate groups like this onto hydroxyl groups of tyrosine residues. Instead, usually they get this phosphate group from uh, ATP molecules. So they take the term, the third phosphate group off an ATP molecule, and in so doing, turn that ATP molecule into an ADP molecule, and then use the energy released by the hydrolysis of the ATP uh, to catalyze the uh, adding on of the phosphate onto the uh, hydroxyl group of the tyrosine. Okay, so uh, the intracellular aspect of these HER2 receptors has a lot of these tyrosine residues, which I will just denote as, denote as these um, little lines here. So these little lines represent tyrosine residues. So both of the HER2 receptors have these uh, tyrosine residues on their intracellular domains. Okay, uh, now what's going to happen now is a phenomenon known as autophosphorylation. So when the two receptors dimerize, and let's call this growth factor, well, HER2 receptor 1, and let's call this HER2 receptor 2, okay? So what's going to happen is once they've dimerized, the tyrosine kinase domain of, um, of um, HER2 receptor 1 is going to phosphorylate the tyrosine residues on HER2 receptor 2. So these are going to get phosphorylated. Okay, and I'll denote that just by those little pink dots. Okay, and this is going to be done by this tyrosine kinase domain here. Similarly, the tyrosine kinase domain of uh, HER2 receptor 2 is going to phosphorylate the tyrosine residues of this first HER2 receptor. So, you're going to get phosphate groups added onto these tyrosine groups as well, like so. Okay, so now... Uh, the intracellular domain of these HER2 receptors has a lot of these phosphorylated tyrosine residues. Now, what can happen is that proteins can come and interact with these phosphorylated tyrosine residues. And we're going to look at two proteins in this video. We're going to look, firstly, at a protein known as GRB2. Okay, ooh, it's not going to fit in there, I don't think. GRB2. Two. Okay, sorry about that. I'll put write its name again out here. And another protein known as PI3 kinase, which I'll denote as PI3K. Okay, right. These are both going to lead to separate signaling pathways. And we will discuss the pathway that GRB2 leads to before we uh, discuss the pathway that PI3 kinase leads to. So we'll come back to PI3 kinase later. At the moment, let's focus on GRB2 over here. Okay, in purple. Now, GRB2, which I'll write out again here, does not stand for Great Britain. Instead, it stands for Growth Factor Receptor Binding Protein 2. So let me write its full name out here. Growth Factor Receptor Binding Protein 2. Okay, so they took the G from growth, they took the R from receptor, and they then took the B from binding. Okay, binding protein 2. 
So that's a big name. So that's why we often denote it GRB2 rather than the growth factor receptor binding protein 2. Okay, so the growth factor receptor binding protein 2, denoted here in purple, comes and binds to the phosphorylated tyrosine residues of uh, the HER2 receptor. Okay, now another protein can come and bind on top of it. So I'll denote this protein here. And this protein is SOS. S-O-S. Okay, so SOS protein is a, um, it's a, G, it's a, it activates monomeric G proteins. And it's specifically going to activate a monomeric G protein known as RAS. Okay, so SOS is here. And basically, once it's bound to this GRB2, it's now going to start activating a monomeric G protein known as RAS. So, let's put this down here. So, RAS is a monomeric G protein. It's not like the normal G proteins we see. The normal G proteins in G protein coupled receptor pathways are heterotrimeric G proteins. RAS is what is known as a monomeric G protein. However, the general principle is the same. It has two states, an on state and an off state. And in the off state, it has guanosine diphosphate, or GDP, bound to it. And in the on state, it has GTP, guanosine triphosphate, bound to it. Now, uh, there are many different types of RAS proteins. We're not going to specify um, which type of RAS protein we're talking about here. We're just going to say a RAS protein, because as far as we're concerned, most, they do the same thing, basically. But there are different types of RAS. Okay, so uh, if you see things like KRAS, NRAS, these are just examples of RAS proteins, and you can put them in here if you wish. Okay, right. So, uh, SOS is um, going to, um, is going to, once it's activated by binding to growth factor receptor binding protein 2, it's going to start catalyzing the conversion of RAS GDP into RAS GTP. So basically, it's going to chop off the GDP from the RAS protein, and it's going to bind guanosine triphosphate to the RAS instead. So it's going to convert the off RAS, where it's got GDP bound to it, into the on RAS, where it's got uh, GTP, guanosine triphosphate, bound to it. So it's going to turn the RAS protein on, basically. Okay, now... The on RAS protein then binds to another protein, which we'll denote here. So it's going to come along and bind to another protein, which is known as RAF. Okay, so RAS activates RAF. Okay, so RAS is going to come along and bind to this RAF protein. And again, there are many different types of RAF. So, um, we're going to keep it general and just call this a general RAS protein. In general, what happens is the on state of the RAS protein then binds and activates the RAF protein. Now, RAF basically is a serine threonine kinase enzyme. Okay, so let's have a reminder of the structure of serine and threonine amino acids. Okay, right. So, um, the structure of serine and threonine amino acids. So again, we'll start off with the basic structure of the amino acid. Here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon, the hydrogen off the alpha carbon, and then we'll draw the carboxylic acid group down here. Okay. Right. Now, um, then the R group, in the case of serine, is a methylene group, like so then with a single hydroxyl group coming off that methylene group. So this is the amino acid serine. Okay, now let's draw the amino acid threonine over here. So again, the basic amino acid structure, here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon with its hydrogen coming off it. And then here's the carboxylic acid group. So the basic structure that all the amino acids share and then the R group is very similar to serine. So you have a single carbon with a hydroxyl, a hydrogen down here, but then it has a methyl group off this carbon here. So this is the structure of threonine. 
Okay, so very similar structures. And again, they can be phosphorylated just like the tyrosine hydroxyl group can. So if we have a phosphate group here, which is phosphorus double bonded to an oxygen, two hydroxyl groups coming off like so, and then an oxygen uh, singly bonded to the phosphorus with a negative charge on because it's acquired an electron ionically from somewhere. And then what can happen is you can form a condensation well, you can form a, um, you can undergo a condensation reaction to remove water, and the oxygen will then bind to this phosphorus atom. And again, serine threonine kinases do ge don't generally add on phosphate groups in this way. They don't generally use um, inorganic phosphate groups like this. They generally will use ATP, which they will then hydrolyze to ADP, and the final terminal phosphate they will then add on to the hydroxyl group of the serine or the threonine. Okay, so those are serine threonine kinases which do that. Serine threonine kinase, of which RAF proteins are an example. Okay, so we'll call it there for this video, and we'll continue our discussion of these uh, pathways in the next video.